Okay, uh, thanks, Naomi. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, satellite applications and tropical cyclone <laughs> forecasting. And since the, I, I figured this is more of a, a modeling group rather than a, uh, a satellite group, I have some uh, pretty basic tutorial information at the beginning. So I'm going to give my uh, two slide version of uh, a review of satellite remote sensing, uh, followed by uh, some satellite applications. And then I'm going to end with talking about a little bit about future uh, satellite systems. Um, the, uh, this talk really has a kind of an operational slant. I'm going to focus primarily on the, on the NOAA geostationary and polar orbiting satellites, although there, there's much more out there. But in, in the 15 or so minutes I have, that's about, uh, I think, all, all that I can do. Uh, kind of the basics of satellite remote sensing you can get by looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, typically, most of the remote sensing is in the visible, the infrared, or the microwave. And uh, one of the uh, Im important things to know is that uh, all of, a lot of these trace gases in the atmosphere have certain vibrational frequencies due to their structure, and that if that happens, that frequency happens to match the frequency of incoming or outgoing radiation, it gets absorbed. So this line here is the transmittance. If you're, if this is up here, it means most of the radiation gets through, and if it's low, it means most of the radiation is absor absorbed by something. Uh, CO2 or water vapor and so on. And the, uh, it turns out that fortunately uh, for us that the, uh, the visible spectrum of the atmosphere is pretty transparent that comes through. Uh, in the infrared, there's a window channel uh, here, uh, but there's, uh, there's also uh, a number of absorption bands. And the, uh, the satellite remote sensing actually takes advantage of some of these uh, absorption bands is that um, when you have an atmos atmospheric sounder, it, it tends to have a very narrow band and what it'll do is it'll move the band along in different uh, frequencies, and it can sort of go up and down one of these bands to get a, a vertical profile of the atmosphere. Um, in the microwave, same thing, that uh, some of these oxygen bands are used for soundings. Um, imagers tend to be wider band instruments uh, looking for features, uh, uh, land-based, and so on. Um, the, the other thing to remember is that if you remember the, uh, the the Planck function, the peak of the Planck function depends on the, uh, the temperature that the radiation is being emitted at. Uh, the sun is much hotter than the Earth, of course, and that uh, maximizes in the visible wavelengths. Uh, typical Earth temperature, it maximizes around 10 microns. And so what you're looking at with remote sensing is when you're in the visible, basically everything is coming from the sun and it's being reflected back. So you're, you're sensing the reflected uh, properties of the Earth and the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, whereas in the infrared in the microwave, you're basically emitting, you're looking at emission that's coming from the Earth and from the atmosphere. Uh, one other important parameter is that the, um, the, what, the way the particles interact with the uh, radiation is that if the wavelength is close to the particle size, they tend to be absorbed and, and re-emitted. And in the visible and the infrared, you're kind of in the same size as cloud particles, which means you don't have a prayer of sensing anything below cloud level. Uh, fortunately, in the microwave, uh, the wavelengths are much longer, a couple centimeters. So they, they, they pretty much can see through most cloud material. It's only when you get to big precipitation-sized particles that you have a problem. Um, one other thing about the microwave is that the, um, the emissivity, which is sort of the amount of radiation that's emitted relative to the, the theoretical Planck function, is kind of low. And as a matter of fact, it's very complicated over land. Uh, it's, it's lower than a black body, and that different characteristics emit uh, different amounts of radiation. And that makes uh, microwave remote sensing over land really hard because you have to know a lot about the uh, land properties. A lot of times you see that uh, microwave data is only used over the ocean, and that's one of the reasons. Okay. Um, most people are familiar with the types of orbits geostationary, and these are basically all meteorological satellites cover the Earth. There's the U.S. GOES, the European Center uh, or the UMETSAT, the Meteosat, um, Japanese satellite, Indian, and the, and the Chinese FY2 series. Um, the low Earth orbit satellites, uh, these, uh, there's an operational systems maintained by uh, the US, the BOES, uh, the European MEDOP, and the, the, the DOD DMSP satellites. And then there's lots and lots of uh, experimental uh, missions that are out there as well. Um, because of the, uh, the properties of the radiation, the, the geostationary satellites typically only have infrared and visible instruments on them. Uh, the, mi the microwave tends to be more on the, uh, the low Earth uh, uh, systems. And there's also some of these systems have, ac have active instruments where they're actually emitting a pulse. And that gives you uh, scatterometer winds, <laughs> altimeters, uh, the radio occultation that Bill Quoke talked about yesterday. 
Um, the resolution and being in the satellite world, you, you never, there's a lot of instruments out there, but it seems like none of them ever give you what you really want. There's always something missing. Uh, the geostationary satellites have very good spatial resolution in the visible and the uh, uh, infrared, have good temporal resolution, but the vertical resolution is bad, that um, you tend to not have um, uh, enough channels, the, the highest spectral resolution, or you're blocked by clouds. Um, on the, the LEO satellites and the, the microwave, the horizontal resolution is good to OK. Uh, the vertical resolution is better, particularly with the microwave instruments. Uh, but then you don't have the temporal resolution. So usually you have to piece a lot of different kinds of information together. Um, current GOES constellation goes east and west. Uh, there's two, right now, There's at least as of the summer, there would be two spares as well as a satellite that uh, we lent to South America. Uh, to, to cover that, so we're we're pretty well stocked with geostationary satellites for the next couple of years. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers around 93 or 94, we were down to one GO satellite, GO-7, and uh, we actually had to borrow one from uh, UMETSAT for a little while. So there's a lot of international uh, coordination with the, um, uh, the, the geostationary satellite system as well as the polar. Uh, NOAA, NOAA operates uh, two uh, polar satellites in high inclination orbits. Uh, basically, uh, there's a, they're in sun-synchronous orbits. They pass uh, the morning satellite and the afternoon satellite. And these typically have uh, the infrared and the microwave instruments on them. Um, lots of NASA missions out there. Uh, maybe some people are familiar with the MODIS data on Terra and Aqua and so on, the, the altimeter missions. Um, but there's lots and lots of data out there that I think that has potential to be used for tropical cyclones. And of course, there's lots and lots of products. Um, I'm not going to go through all these, but just to say that there's lots of stuff out there again. Um, so for uh, using the satellite data in hurricane forecasting, um, I kind of went through this list. And this follows fairly closely to uh, what Richard Pash went over yesterday, the, the basic uh, forecast process, starting with a monitoring the, the, the tropics. Um, once you have a storm for center location and um, a structure estimation, uh, it's very useful, actually, for identifying synoptic features, uh, sea surface temperature products. And of course, the one I've highlighted here in red is, is one of the most important, is assimilating into numerical models. And uh, uh, Sharon, who's going to talk after me, is going to um, go over that, so I'm not going to say anything else about that. Um, they are also, uh, an, a fairly new use is for model validation, is actually comparing the model output in radiant space, and I'll show a few examples of that. And then uh, another use is in, um, as predictors in statistical intensity models. Um, one thing to keep in mind when I go through the examples in the rest of the talk is that uh, if from a data simulation point of view, all the information that's being extracted uh, from these uh, fairly simple products should also be able to be extracted in a data simulation system if it was sophisticated enough. And you can, from the examples, I'll show that there, there actually is quite a bit of information that, that can be useful, uh, even near the storm center as well as in the environment. Um, this is just a, a typical GOES uh, loop, a visible loop. And identifying when tropical cyclone genesis actually occurs is, is not always so obvious, even when you have recon data. But the, uh, the visible and then the infrared at night is uh, is one of the primary tools that's used for that. This is the initial formation stages of a Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Um, the Dvorak technique, this was developed in the 70s and 80s. And it's basically is a, is a pattern recognition technique that uses uh, both visible and infrared. Uh, it converts a satellite image to a T number from 1 to 8, and that corresponds to an intensity. And this is uh, Hurricane Linda from 1997, which is one of the few T8s that was ever identified in the Dvorak system uh, by the Dvorak technique in the uh, Western Hemisphere. It's easy to find them in the Eastern Hemisphere, but not, not so common in the Western Hemisphere. And despite the fact that uh, this has been around a long time, I, I believe you could still say that it's, it's the cornerstone of, of intensity estimation around the globe. Um, even in the Atlantic, it still plays a, a fairly important role, uh, even with the aircraft data. Um, in terms of wind structure, there's lots of sources. Um, with the uh, AMSU data looking at the, the warm core, the resolution isn't good enough to resolve the inner core structure, but it's pretty good at resolving the uh, outer core winds. This is just converting temperatures to heights and then using a balance equation. Um, these are uh, feature track winds. I believe that Jim Gerst talked about how those are one of the most important uh, factors in the uh, uh, 
track forecasting and not not so good here for this particular storm case but there were some on the periphery it was basically blocked by the uh, overcast scatterometer data unfortunately there's no more quick scat but we have a scat um, and then uh, the inner core winds and you can bo combine this whole information in a simple objective analysis and and get a pretty decent idea of what the surface wind field looks like. And again, in, in a simulation system should be able to do that as well. Um, this is a, maybe a non-standard product. This is a, a water vapor imagery, and what you're seeing is the circulation. Um, in this particular case, it's storm relative. So Hurricane Fred is always right there in the middle. And this was a very good case of where you could identify a a fairly substantial trough that amplified uh, to the west of Fred and eventually uh, led to its demise. And as Richard mentioned yesterday, a lot of times the forecasters want to get a feel for what the synoptic situation is and whether or not the models are handling that right. You could really see that this trough was digging pretty deep and just basically swept up the, the circulation. Um, these are just some, tip, some sample ocean products. This is an oceanic heat content analysis that um, uh, came from a National Hurricane Center uh, based on satellite altimetry, and this was a microwave sea surface temperature analysis. And you can see why it's so important to look at the uh, subsurface ocean structure. Um, there's The gradients here are much bigger in the heat content due to the differences in thermocline depth and so on relative to the fairly flat sea surface temperature analysis. Um, talk briefly about the use for uh, verification. Um, <clears throat> the idea there is that Similar to data simulation, the one of the first steps is you take your model fields, run it through radiative transfer models, and, and convert it to radiance base. And the, simula the simulation procedure tries to uh, modify the initial conditions so that those things match. Uh, but you can also use that same procedure uh, just to evaluate your model. Um, this is a, an example of a, a, her uh, a wharf simulation, not a hurricane wharf, but a regular wharf. Uh, the top is. Um, real infrared data and from GOES, and the bottom is uh, simulated from the model, and they look you know, kind of similar. Um, the visible, same kind of thing. Uh, typically, though, if you look closely at visible, there's sort of a giveaway in that. Um, the scattering is, is a, is a three-dimensional scattering is a really difficult problem, and you don't see things in the uh, simulated data like cloud shadows that you, because it's usually plain uh, parallel assumptions. So usually uh, visible is, is, is a little bit more difficult to do, but you can get some idea of how the model is behaving. Um, this is my one uh, uh, quiz question. Uh, this again is a, this is a hurricane wharf simulation. One of these is real and one of them is simulated infrared. Um, if, you, if you had to guess which one, one was which, um, I'll give you five seconds to guess. <laughs> Uh, okay, this one's simulated. That one's real. <laughs> um, that you can see, you can see right off the bat how you could use this for model verification. A, a couple things jump out at you right away. Katrina was big, but it wasn't that big. You know, there's somewhat of a bias in the in the wharf simulation there. It's an interesting cloud top structure. You've got rain bands, and um, if you use the multispectral imagery, you can also tell a lot about the cloud properties. Uh, particle size and so on. And since I'm, um, I'm going to try to wrap this up in two more minutes. Okay. Um, I, uh, let's see. James showed these yesterday. These are the, the trends in track and intensity. And you can see my, my graph goes back further, so my lines actually do slope down a little bit by about 0.6% uh, per year. But still, these lines aren't sloping as much as those. And uh, one of the reasons is that the best models are still statistical, which James Franklin pointed out yesterday. And one of the reasons is that we use the, um, uh, the statistical models can extract data directly from the satellite imagery, um, from the heat content, and we also use information directly from GOES, and this has predictive uh, information in it. So with that, I think I will go to my last slide. I had a couple things on um, other, other types of micro using microwave imagery, and then a little summary of where we're headed. I did want to show my, um, my one my one attempt at a joke. The um, uh, I was reviewing the next generation GOES data as well as uh, NPOS, and uh, this was my headline that uh, finally the NPOS is resolved. That there was a divorce between NOAA and the DoD. They're going their own way now, and so every, everything's happy again. We're doing this with NOAA and NASA. Your name it is. I have it here. Uh, JRSS. Does I have that right? JPSS. Yeah. I, I haven't learned it yet. Gypped. <laughs> uh, 
this was a mess, but it, I think maybe it's finally straightened out, and then I'll skip my lightning stuff. Uh, the main point I wanted to make is that there's lots of stuff out there, and I think even now it's not uh, fully utilized. Okay, thanks.